Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Lore Beards. We got another great special episode uh, today. We've got the one and only Steve D with us here. Uh, very, very uh, exciting. He's got a lot of really cool things uh, that we're going to chat with him about. Uh, so without wasting any time, uh, just because, as always, with all things in life, we're on the clock. Uh, Steve, if you'd go ahead and kind of introduce yourself and what you've worked on over the years and kind of let people know who you are. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thanks for having me on first. Um, my name's Steve D. That's that's actually a pseudonym that I use these days because of the internet, but uh, you may know me as Steve Darlington. That's the name I did some of my Warhammer work under. Uh, I started working for Warhammer with the Warhammer Companion in 2nd Edition, although I did do some stuff for Warpstone before that. I started playing Warhammer back in the late 80s. Um, yeah, and then when 2nd when Edition came out, I wrote for the Warhammer Companion, I wrote for Children of the Horned Rat, which we won um, some Ennies for, uh, Realm of the Ice Queen, the Kislev book, Night's Dark Masters, um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Shades of Empire, did a few books for 3rd Edition as well, um, the Big Adventure, whose name will come to me, something about the storm, uh, the... Uh, there's a, a series of adventures set in a town where, where it's storming and raining the whole time. I can't remember what it was called now. Um, and um, I've done some stuff for 4th edition. Um, I've become a little bit of a guru about vampires because of the vampire book, but also about halflings because I've always loved them. I wrote a big chunk of them um, for Shades of Empire in 2nd edition. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when they did the halflings in um, Empire Companion, I think it's called, or Guide to the Empire... Uh, the, the archives books for fourth edition. Yeah, the, ar the, the archives, archives of the Empire. Yep. Yep. Uh, so I wrote the halfling section in that as well, um, and the stuff about the moot, um, which was really fun. And I've just um, last year I worked on the Lustria book, awesome. which I hear is just going out to people. Um, so it's been a, it's been a. Well, let me think. It's almost. It's been like. 15, 16 years, no, maybe 17 years now, um, of working on and off with different companies, back all the way to Green Ronin um, and Hogshead. Um, I, uh, Warhammer has been with lots of companies, but I've worked on it in lots of different ways. Well, that's fantastic. So there is a there is a ton of really uh, juicy publications in there. Um uh, but let's start, let's start with the halflings. Um, just cause, uh, you mentioned them specifically and halflings are, I, I really feel like they are the kind of the ultimate underappreciated darlings of, uh, Warhammer fantasy. Cause you know, they don't tend to show up a lot in like the, the, the battles of like the, yeah. the tabletop game and stuff. So I think for a lot of people, they kind of fly under the radar being the stealthy little gits they are. Um, but, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, as far as like looking at um, Warhammer halflings, I think most people when they hear like halfling or hobbit, uh, they kind of immediately their brain sort of jumps to like Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. So for people that are kind of um, unfamiliar uh, with Warhammer halflings, what what kind of separates them as being unique in the pack as far as compared to like the halflings of the D and D verse or the the hobbits of Warhammer fantasy? Because there are some <laughs> there are some pretty uh, interesting differences between the group. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of... When, when they sort of were starting up Warhammer, they borrowed a lot from other settings because th that's what you do in fantasy settings. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that are very similar to other, other worlds. They do like, um, you know, they, they tend to be very domestic characters. They tend to be uh, loving food and, 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 and fun and the half. Um, there's a few extra tweaks. They're resistant to chaos. Um more than more than humans, um, and more than most of the other races, which is interesting. They have this secret bond with with the ogres, um, mm. which is something buried in their past. Um, I think what's partly different for me is is a lot of a lot of Warhammer has these lovely elements of satire in them, which sometimes is pushed to the background and pulled to the front, depending on what kind of product or who's writing it. Right. Um, but if you've um, a lot of uh, the, the European you know, origins of the, were very based on class um, elements, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a lens of understanding the class system and the peasant system um, that comes through the writing that isn't there in a lot of um, American fantasy. And halflings in a bit sort of represent the kind of servant classes and the underclasses 
you can of course have poor humans and, and things like that, but if you if you've ever seen any kind of you know Shakespearean play, for example, there are very clearly the main characters who are these very fancy people who speak good English, and then there's the common as muck people um, who run around, do all the work, all the servants, and they get very put upon, uh, made fun of, and that's sort of the niche that that halflings um, occupy. So you can have a lot of fun with them. They're they're these sort of uh, often spat upon, often ignored characters. And then you can go, well, what does that tell us about a system? Like, who are these people? What would it be like to have a class of people who are, you know, seen as lesser than everyone else? And that gives them a sort of uh, different kind of position in society that they use to their own power. You know, people ignore them. People over uh, underestimate them. Um, people think they're all jolly and, and happy and, and domestic, which means that Nobody expects it when they steal your stuff. Um, I also like to think of the halflings as very much... Um, uh, they're, 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 they're tricksters, and they like to play jokes on people, and that, can, and that has uh, all sorts of dimensions to it as well. So, mm. um, you know, they'll give people wrong directions just because it's funny. And again, that comes <laughs> from a place of power, because they know that humans are going to be messing with them. So if they see a human, they're like, well, you're fair game, because you make more money than me, you control more society, so we're going to mess with you. And when I wrote the Moot book, uh, Moot guide for, um, for, for, for archives, it was really, yeah, focusing on what would a, what, what, is the, what does the Moot look like, you know, if you're a visitor? And there's a lot in there about how, if you're a visitor, they're going to take advantage of you. They're going to, like, make up things and right. mm. tell you, lead you around the block and... and charge you extra fees and, and see how much they can lie to you about magic halfling traditions and um, all that sort of thing. So it's it's a lot of fun to play that kind of character as someone who um, is in a lower social rung but has a, a way and a power to that. Um, right. Mm -hmm. And that's a really fun thing to explore. Right. So, um, so looking at kind of like the Warhammer world as like, it's, you know, it tends to be this very grim and perilous place where there's all sorts of nightmarish creatures all over the place. And like the halflings in particular, the moot, um, although in a lot of ways, kind of like this wonderful fertile land, you know, that produces, it's, it's like almost the breadbasket of the empire in a lot of ways. Um, you know, they've also got this very spooky adjacent neighbor being Sylvania. Um, oh. and you know, they're very close to Blackfire pass where you got green skins coming through all the time or yep. piece of chaos. Um, what do you think, um, really goes into making something like the halflings as far as you have this creature that for the most part is kind of diminutive. Like they're not very, they're not able to like, you know, pick up a sword necessarily and go toe to toe with the various creatures of Warhammer. Um, how, how do you take halflings and make them really work and survivable in a world mm. um, like Warhammer fantasy as dangerous and dark and terrible as it can be? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's a good question. It sort of it does actually play up the fact that sometimes the system, the setting is it, it can highlight that darkness um, mm. because in many cases you just can't compete. Um, but also, you know, that can be no fun to play. So you've got um, you know, there is the resistance to chaos. There is also, I think, um, a sense of uh, you know the fact that they're overlooked. You know, and right. And, mm. Um, different versions have given bonuses to halflings in that sense that they are just better at dealing with larger creatures because they just don't see them. You know, they can move behind them and things like that. Mm. I'm not sure what fourth ed, if fourth ed has anything like that. Um, and uh, yeah, sometimes of course there's they historically in different systems they've had more fate points. They're just more lucky, uh, more blessed by the gods, and um, so that can be an interesting sort of thing. You've got a character who who is is sort of um, less likely to fight their way out and more likely to fluke their way out or run their way out or something like that. Um, but again, also, yeah, I think it's also a bit of a challenge to go, well, if I was to field these guys, you know, what would they do? How would I make them powerful? Um, and sometimes that, that, that it does appear in the battle game as well, where you've got like the goblins or the noblars or, you know, there used to be halflings in the human races and you'd be like, well, can I make these guys, you know, break a charge or kill a hero? And, mm. and that can actually be a really fun thing to play around with. Like, 
I know they're basically weak, but if I field enough of them or if I put them in the right place, you know. Uh, my friend and I still talk about this one game where we had, um, it was Noblars, not, not Halflings, but they broke by sheer good rolls, like a Bretonian charge. <laughs> um, and that's just like, yeah, that's that's a fun story to sort of think right. about. These, these, these sort of very scrappy, you know, peasant types with broken bottles and pots on their head just standing up to these these incredibly large characters and... Um, yeah, I think I think if you're playing a, a halfling, you're you're going in, going. Let's see what I can get away with. Let's see yeah. mm-hmm. if I can um, make this happen. And that that's a real um, a different kind of play style for someone who's like, well, I want to be tough. I want to be, you know, give me a. a, yeah. a, a I want to be the six spot. foot eight Ulrican with the <laughs> the giant axe. That's, right. that's right. That's That's someone who's like, I don't want to. I don't want to be in danger. Whereas the halfling player is like come at me I, I think i can survive i'll think i'll find a way and that really mimics the kind of um psychology of the halflings as well They're like life has come at us and we remain we survive yeah and um and you know it's it's so interesting that um i you know in a lot of uh, kind of like black library stories there have been a lot of halflings that have really stuck out to me over the years in that um i can't remember what which exact book is it but they're i think one of kind of the most common uses of like quote unquote evil halflings is you get these like gang leaders and it turns out to be a halfling who's just horrifically ruthless because in order to you know maintain power as a halfling they have to be way scarier than (laughs) everybody else Uh, and they can be uh, which is always kind of the thing one of the things i love about them is that it halflings you know it is it's still warhammer they're still dangerous you know (laughs) um you know it's kind of like how A lot of people in history really underestimate how dangerous, like, the sling is as a weapon. You know, the ability yeah, to spin a yeah. rock around and throw it. And halflings are terrifyingly accurate <laughs> when it comes to hurling a rock at somebody. Um, which, you know, in, yeah. in, in old myth, Goliath learned to his detriment. <laughs> um, hmm. But... Yeah, uh, the... Uh, oh, go ahead. Go? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say that the, the, the emblem of the halfling empire is the, is the rooster, because... They're quite small, but they can be incredibly dangerous. Mm. Like that, um, and they they jump with these huge claws, and and so that's very much their their spirit. It's like, don't yeah underestimate us to your to your peril because we will just absolutely mess you up. <laughs> yes, which uh, so um, one thing I had to ask about. Um, I I absolutely loved your your halfling stuff, uh, especially in the archives volume one. Um, the, I felt like the halflings got a lot of really amazing stuff uh, in fourth edition from like um, the general book um, and this book really kind of doing a good job of diving into like the halfling pantheon and giving some good looks yep. at like Esmeralda and the other gods, uh, which is so yep. great to see. Cause, and like, and you even give uh, you even talk a little bit about here in a, uh, about a half and half, I think it is uh, a ha- yep. half and yep. half, half the halfling language, yep. which is so awesome. Um, and you even like, you even include these amazing little uh, notes about like how to use it properly, um, yep. which is great because language is kind of so underdeveloped typically um, mm. for for Warhammer Fantasy and that like we know they're out there, but like you know, like Grumbarth for instance, the ogre language we know it exists, but we don't really yep. know a lot about it. Um, is there? But like kind of looking at these kind of more rare things popping up, was there anything you wanted? to do with the halflings but like due to space or due to just time wasn't able to fit into the writings you've been able to put out so far um i mean i can't think of anything offhand i i I do hope that the you know it doesn't get lost luckily a lot of warhammer gets preserved Mm. but um you know there's things in in shades of empire that isn't in um uh isn't in in archives obviously um right. and there's, there's sort of it's get it's quite scattered it's all and, and it's all just collected in my head um one thing i do i do want to i'd love to explore the gods a little bit more we didn't have a huge amount of space for that and mm. um i was actually the first person to specify who was there besides esmeralda which was um uh a really lovely thing to leave on the on the law um and yeah the the culture of of because halflings, their, their religion is is not like a human religion. They're they're almost folk heroes, and that right. means there's mm-hmm. probably a lot of tales, right? And um, so it would be more like some of the maybe American uh, Native American stories about you know coyote or the Islander stories about Maui. There'd be these stories about how 
you know, Esmeralda, you know, killed an army by baking a huge pie or something. And <laughs> yeah, imagine a great lot of, a lot of trickster tales as well that that, that fall into these things. Um, and yeah, developing that would be really interesting. Um, yeah. So we... and that. Oh no! Go ahead. Keep yeah. going. Oh, uh, you go. So yeah, so just kind of wanting to dive into the gods a little bit, where we've had so the the four that get talked about um, in in the book, though, like you said, it'd be lovely to see them expanded more. Um, I I hope we are able to get like a type of tome of salvation book for fourth edition someday, where it's kind of like all about yeah. the gods and religions and stuff, where we've got Esmeralda, uh, Hyacinth, or um, uh, Josias and Quinsberry. Um, and yep. what's interesting is they they don't cover a lot of the. Um, domains that people wouldn't necessarily expect of gods because I think of what you mentioned of that they're almost kind of more like like they're kind of like a half and half almost between like traditional gods and the ancestor gods uh, of the dwarves yeah. where they're these they yeah. weren't you know purely mytho uh, likely mythological figures but probably more like halflings who have kind of been revered to the point where they've become something more um, yeah. which I imagine likely explains why they don't tend to be uh, super the halflings probably are not as big on like priests out there wielding like crazy miracles and yeah. stuff because their gods were not kind of the typical magical entities, um, but a little oh. more of these like actual um, figures who have kind of been preserved into myth and legend. Um, yeah. So, and so for anyone uh, at home who hasn't had the chance to read it yet, we've got Esmeralda, who's kind of that traditional halfling God of like the hearth and home. You got hospitality in there. Hyacinth is then this goddess of childbirth, fertility, uh, uh, sex and a lot of those things that come with like uh, family making Josias being kind of the outside stuff with animal farming and domesticate stuff in Quinsbury uh, being kind of, I guess the more, the most kind of uh, like um, uh, sophisticated, I guess in a way with knowledge, ancestry and tradition, but all those are very kind of like homely traditional type yeah. things. Um, you know, there's no war God. There's no, there's no God of death. There's no God of, um, you know, uh, all these other kind of more morbid things. Um, mm. so, uh, I, I guess where I'm curious to go with that is kind of what, what inspired you to focus, uh, on those particular domains and kind of, I guess, resist the, cause it feels like every Warhammer race kind of almost has the same little, um, uh, not cookie cutter, but like, there's almost like a template of like, okay, we yeah. have to have these gods and kind of fill in, but the halflings don't, they, they break away from that format. Um, and you also broke yeah. away from the resist, you know, the, the urge I'm sure to just have a single God and, you know, keep it easy. So what, what kind of led into you splitting up the way you chose to do so? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, um, I'm just pulling it up myself. I know there was, um, we had a, we had a conversation for this when we were working on Shad um, shades of empire, which, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately I can't grab off my shelf at the moment. Um, but, uh, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was, I, th I, th I think it was important to sort of find a way, as you say, to not be like everyone else's gods, um, uh, and to really tie into what it makes halflings different. And so it, a lot of, I mean, this is why I like writing about religion and stuff is that it's really a way of sort of expressing the values of a culture mm. and what things do they believe in and, and, um, what matters to them and it's not the same you know they, they are um they're not humans they're not all about blood and violence and and conquering um and um the original um yeah the the the, the for shades of empire i wrote something called the quinsbury Lodge, and um that's basically a sort of empire uh society um, for, uh, for, for halflings who are outside of the moot. And it, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a little bit like organized crime, but it's, it's also just, a, a, a society for, for halflings. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's when Queensbury first emerged because I was like, okay, well, I want the, this to have a sense of, um, uh, yeah, you know, it has to be named after a tradition, sort of thing. It needs to be something that that is named after some sort of figure that is more than just um, the person who started it. So I was like, okay, well, we we've got Esmeralda. We know that they have something like a god, and so it was a way of sort of extrapolating from there. Um, right. And 
what do they believe in? Well, they, they do believe in family lines. Um, that's going to be important. They do believe in domesticity. They do believe in... Um, they do believe they have a very uh, free and open um, uh, attitudes to, 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 to sex and romance that, that is very different to the prudish humans. Right. Um, and again, that's another sort of Shakespearean reference where the, um, the lower classes can talk about these things and they're, therefore they're going to be the rude, bawdy characters. So there had to be a, um, some representation of that, yeah. Um, and yeah, it was it was it was just sort of going down. And go. I think I think I do that with whenever I'm writing anything. It's like, what do these people believe? Mm -hmm. What um, what are their what what do they value in their culture? Um, and and how do I express that? Whether that's in gods or in actions or or whatever. Because I think that's really what makes role playing. Well, it's a big part of what's interesting about role playing is going. Well, what does my character think? What does your character think? You know, what does this village think is is important. Um, and, yeah. and having those explorations. Yeah, and I, I think you went with such an amazing set of like values to pursue and gods to explore because it also kind of reminds me of um, it. It almost kind of feels like you can almost see where the halflings were kind of uh, at least somewhat more related to like the ancient human tribes that kind of get talked about, uh, or like the yeah. ancient cults with like Tall and Raya and those who have become less popular with time, where you have these more like orderly gods that are much more you know that form of prudishness where they're far more like, no, we have to resist all forms of temptation because that could lead to chaos, even though by making it more cut off, they're kind of like adding to the excitement of it and all this stuff. Um, instead yeah. of like yeah. properly exploring how to face, you know, fight off against it. Um, and, but it's really interesting to see how the halflings have kind of managed to hold on, uh, to their culture, maybe, you know, and likely in part to their resistance to chaos and that they don't necessarily have as many spiritual threats, as uh, um, average humans maybe tend to do. Yeah, um, yeah. It's also a bit of um, I think a, uh, as you say, uh, a call, um, a chicken and an egg. By by not making it such a big deal, they they don't. It doesn't end up being such a big deal. Right. Um, because because they're not constantly going God against chaos. Um, they don't end up making it this big, sexy taboo that humans are like, well, maybe we should embrace <laughs> chaos. Yeah. Um, um, so one of the things, uh, I kind of want to talk about. So one of my favorite things that got introduced in Archives of the Empire volume one, like of the entire book were the badger riders. Um, I <laughs> love the badger riders. I have been, uh, I cannot tell you how many times I have pestered developers at total war being like hey if we ever get mercenary units i need i need halfling badger riders and that they're this surprisingly terrifying uh halfling melee group uh which you know most people don't think they kind of remind me a lot of almost like a kind of more updated and less absurd in a way a version of a uh, lump and croc uh, lump and crooks fighting cocks the uh yeah. the, the the super famous um regiment of renown or uh, dog of war uh giant rooster riding <laughs> halflings yes um yeah so where where did the badger riders what what was the decision to kind of look at all of the possibilities of like all right we're going to introduce some new halfling careers and you go you know what badgers <laughs> well what what i found when i was doing i for for this one i had to do a lot of research because i wanted to like make sure i covered everyone's idea of everything they'd seen of the halflings um so I went through a lot of the old old books, um, and a lot of people over time have gone like introduced minis and ideas of them riding different creatures, and and um, there was um, sheep. There was like a mini of someone riding a sheep. There was the people riding the chickens. There was definitely some mention somewhere that I found of them riding swans, mm -hmm. and and. Um, I just started going, okay, well, there's probably going to be, um, you know, just these, if, if there's so many, it, it's, it's also a bit of like, um, art imitating life. Like I kept finding all these little half mentions in things. So I thought, well, okay, that's probably a lot of legends there. There's right. probably just things like if you're living in the empire and you go, oh, Bob told me they rode swans and, and, and someone told me they rode sheep. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, there's probably then, um, uh, legends that just go, well, what if they wrote this? What if they wrote that? Um, 
they definitely, yeah, they definitely existed. There were minis for the Ram cavalry. That's what I've just found. Um, and then I thought, well, what are some of the, the sort of outlandish myths that might exist? And um, it was actually the editor, I think it was Dave, who said, like, we should, given that so much of the halflings are based on this sort of, is that true? Is that true? Why don't we actually make that a mechanic of, like, putting in a, a, a mechanic, a rule that sort of is like, is this legit? That's up to you, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, and that plays on the sort of halfling things of when you're in the moot, you're like, they do ride sheep into battle, so why could they ride badges? And you're never quite sure. Mm. Um, that was just a lot of fun to just go, let's what? make a, a rule that works the same way. So that was, um, yeah, I came up with, with this sort of list of things that we might use, and then Dave was like, oh, yeah, we should actually make a career out of that. Um, yeah. So that was really fun. Yeah, and it's it, well, it's so clever too because like it would be very easy to adjust the career if anyone wanted to to be where you could ride a giant chicken if you want or a ram. Yeah, uh, yeah. like it would not be hard at all. Like I think the badger would easily be the most terrifying option uh, because badgers yeah. are scary. <laughs> but but uh, yes, um, I I love it so much, and it and it, it I don't know badgers kind of. Uh, and I, I think you talk about this in the career, but badgers kind of have a lot in common with halflings um, and a lot yes. of like um, their various things where it's like they're kind of adorable looking, but at the same time, they're incredibly dangerous. <laughs> they, yeah. you know, they like to yeah. live underground and all this stuff. Uh, but that's such a marvelous Very career. True. I've always, I know, yep. like, I, I don't know when it's going to happen, uh, but one of these days I'm going to play a campaign where I'm finally going to play a halfling and I'm playing a badger rider. Um, <laughs> nice. that, that is my go-to. Um but, uh, yeah. so, so something I wanted to ask about, and I, I kind of actually just saw this question come up in chat as well. What has there ever been kind of a temptation to go? I'm sure a lot of people wonder like, okay, well, if halflings are kind of, uh, you know, they tend to rely more on like shooting type weaponry. They tend to be very ballistic skill heavy, uh, when they do go into battle, uh, whether you have like, yeah. you know, slingers or field wardens, um, uh, was there kind of any, um, desire or um, thought put into like, oh, well, why don't halflings like use guns? Kind of these great equalizers um, of like pulling out or like somehow having halfling sized firearms and using those. I mean, it was never something that we wanted to uh, make difficult or impossible. It just sort of, again, it's part of it is um, uh, it's, it's sort of history, right? Mm. There isn't a lot of what, what one of the hard parts about working on an RPG like Warhammer where there is so much lore is that you you feel a, a duty to reflect everything that's come before but you don't always you just don't want to bore people you you also want to add new things um, and it's a balancing act between like if we suddenly said that halflings all had you know there was lots of there's a huge part of the halfling society that had guns that might not quite strike the right um, tone people might oh that doesn't feel like what I know about halflings, right? And there's certainly some reasons that we sort of talked about. Is like, well, it 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 also comes into that sort of um, you were talking about earlier that the the halflings are a bit more pastoral and like humans were thousands of years ago, mm. and so they're a little bit less modern. I I get the idea that it's harder for them to just get gunpowder. They don't live near mountains. They can't dig up the the sulfur and the things that they need. They don't have as much. Um, big cities with a lot of technical know-how concentrated in an area. So it just hasn't become a part of their culture for those reasons. Um, we didn't feel that there was a need for a specific halfling, um, you know, gun, gunner kind of character mm. because, um, you know, I'm pretty sure that the there's no exclusions on, on the, the, you know, the, the oh, no, pistolier like, characters. You, yeah, if you wanted to use one, you absolutely could. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's also a balancing act in a role-playing game is like, um, there's, there's what you say definitely can't happen. There's what you sort of encourage by evidence. And then you go, well, if, otherwise, if it, if it doesn't say you, you can't go nuts. So yeah, there's definitely lots of options for, for gun wielding, um, halflings. There just might not be a picture of it or, you know, um, uh, a, a particular career for it. And, um, I think, I think... What's good about Warhammer is it is a very flexible sort of system in most of its in its role playing games and like in Warhammer in in D and D if there isn't a sort of this race this class this subclass build 
you don't do it. Whereas in Warhammer, you can mm. go, oh, okay, I rolled really high BS and I live in Nuln. Um, I'll be, I'll get, I'll go into the gunner career because that makes sense, you know? And then, mm. yeah, there's much more flexibility. Yeah. There's a lot of that kind of open door system of, oh, well th I could kind of push this door open and see where it takes me, but there's all yeah. like these other different paths I can go. I mean, um, I was talking to, um, um, I think Andy law last week about how, like I started off playing a witch hunter in a campaign I'm in right now. But after like an incident where Bogenhofen literally got blown up because my character couldn't chase a stupid demon down fast enough, um, you know, <laughs> yep. I was like, that really deeply affected me and my character of like, okay, well, I'm going to go into the runner career then, you know, the, the messenger career. Yes. And I'm going to yep, focus yep. on really going up these movement things of my character really kind of pushing himself as far hard as he can physically so that could never happen again. <laughs> yep, <laughs> um, yep. You know, and, um, uh, yeah, I, that, that, that's, that's, go. Yep. Well, it's just, that's just like one of the big strengths of the system is that you can kind of pivot on a dime, um, to change a lot yep. about your character to fit their personal narrative, which is something I've always really loved about it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the career system is really great for that. And I think everyone's got a story like that where I started out like this, but then I was like, oh, I really need that weapon or that skill. So I decided I was going to be this part of this career. And that, that's actually, I think, a, a really great part of the system. People think, oh, you're abusing the system if you just went off to do that to get that stat. No, that's exactly what, how it should work. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's just playing the game. <laughs> that's right. And it, it leads to great stories. Um, yeah, we had a... You know, we, we, we've, had, we've had stories like that where we had a guy who started as a noble and then he decided that the noble class were all crap, so he went off and became a highwayman. And that was just a really great <laughs> story. Really and cool. It ended yeah. up being a bit like the Scarlet Pimpernel because the, the noble class were like, who is this ruffian? And he's like, oh, I surely have never met the man, you know? And um, Yeah, so it just was a, a, great, a great pivot. Awesome. Uh, speaking of kind of like other people's campaigns... Um, one thing I've always kind of, um, I've talked to people getting into Wolfrup about who maybe they like, they do the random generation, they roll up a halfling or they think about playing a halfling is that it's, it, it could be a very intimidating, um, race to play. Um, being that, you know, they, they, they are, they're so vulnerable. They have the small rule, which can be very spooky. Um, yep. would you kind of have any words of advice for new players or even experienced players who want to play a halfling or are uh, randomly generate a halfling and they're looking at it going, I want to do this, but I don't know how while also avoiding dying in like the first session. <laughs> yeah. Look, um, I think, I think the first thing is. Talk to your GM and your group. Um, uh, it, it's also going to depend on which edition. I, I'm still... I, I spend so much on second um, that every time I'm reading four, I have to go, wait, no, those rules are second edition. Um, so that's going to be a factor is talk to your... Talk, figure out what system you're using. Um, but also, yeah, talk to your GM because if you're making... Uh, this is true, of, again, it comes back to that flexibility. The other side of the flexibility is that you can end up with characters that don't suit the kind of thing that you're, you're, you're playing. Mm. Um if you all make, you know, um, a bunch of thieves and grave diggers, you're not going to be good at a court campaign. If you make a lot of um, fops and dandies and halflings and cooks, and then the GM's right, right, you're all off to Blackfire Pass to kill greenskins. You'll be like, well, uh, <laughs> yeah. we didn't build for that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they can be fun for a fish out of water. But, um, yeah, so um, I think the thing is, yeah, figure out um, what kind of stories you're telling and how you fit into the group and and use it like um you have good bs skills stay out of the front line mm. um use your hiding <laughs> um and um yeah don't be afraid to be like again warhammer is a system that is it's it's it provides a lot of opportunity to play it in a more narrative way you don't have to attack every round you know you can be like well this ca this for this next bit of the fight i'm going to be hiding up behind the fighter you know, because that's just um, mm. in character, and it can be fun and funny for me. And um, yeah, you can you can always um, have spotlight without necessarily being combat effective, right? Um, well, and I and, and 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I, I think another thing that y'all have done a really good job of um, when looking at the role play games, even back in second edition, but especially in fourth edition, is this idea of like, maybe, you know, that dealing damage is not the only way to victory of like, there are like such yeah. great ideas for, you can use like almost fellowship stuff to make yourself appear non-threatening, you know, make yourself like yep. appear like cowering and stuff thing. And then like, you know, a beast man is going to be far less interested in going after the little meek halfling if there's a big dude with a sword swinging it around if the halfling's doing what he can to kind of stay out of sight, but is setting yep. up for something, you know, more ingenious or uh, tricksy. Um, yeah, Fori does a really good job of that, um, of, of giving you ways to use, yeah, your stats in, in effective ways that aren't just strength behind a weapon and clever fighting. Um, and, and yeah, look, and again, it can produce, like... And, and if you're smart with, like, even back in second edition, I remember, again, just thinking about great halfling stories. We had a moment where, um, you know, there was going to be a street fight. So this, the the halfling ran away, found a bakery that was run by halflings, came back with a, just a whole bunch of baked goods, and for the entire fight was throwing, <laughs> like, powdered donuts into the street from, like, the next building away with this oh. huge BS. And so... I just decided, okay, that's going to make it really hard for the, the the enemy to fight. So they kept missing their attack rolls, and it mm. actually became this story of, like, the halfling throwing pies just saved our ass. Um, and, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a little bit slapstick, and it's a little bit comedy. And, again, that fits the genre, though. You, you uh, Right. Well, it, I mean, it fits halflings. I mean, I think the most devastating halfling siege weapons are literally a steam tank that was converted to shoot soup boiling soup at people and then the halfling hot pot catapult which is one of my favorite war machines because it just yeah <laughs> it just shoots bowls of soup which granted you know come at catapult speeds and that would kill someone <laughs> pretty reliably um yeah absolutely yeah uh yeah i love that and and i think for a lot of people you, you know especially if you're wanting to really delve into like the actual role play aspect even in fighting scenarios you, you can never underestimate fellowship and halflings are so good at that um, yeah like they are really just kick ass when it comes to fellowship abilities uh and really bringing a lot to the table of like you can manipulate you know people against one another or third parties especially with a gm yeah. that realizes that is something that you really want to try and do and really uh rely on uh as a potential yeah. weapon um and uh yeah look that goes back to it, it wasn't always well done but um the uh the kenda Back in, in Dragonlance, so I don't know if you know that, but there was a D&D &D setting called Dragonlance, and they were trying to tap into this same idea that sort of, it existed in fiction before it quite was in, was in war, um, or role-playing games. So like, um, in Warhammer, it comes out as halflings are very gregarious and, and they're good at, at manipulating people. In the Dragonlance Center, they basically invented this thing that was like, they're not quite D&D &D halflings, but they're actually a lot like Warhammer halflings, and they called them Kenda, and they actually had specific mechanics where they called the, this taunt ability that nobody else got where they could just make anyone you know and in, insane with rage um <laughs> and and uh it was a it was a very um it, it added it added a lot to the game and again it added a lot of, yes that is exactly what i want to play and a lot of bard things in D D work the same way it's like i want to be the guy who makes people crazy um and it's a it's a long time established uh um literary idea yeah that there's this character that um that that can just because he's he's never afraid and he's always um uh you know he's always just making a joke and and defeating um the threat by just going i'm not afraid of you um that's a huge trope and yeah great for halflings mm. so uh, so halflings, uh, something that, you know, uh, something we talk a lot about in the total war community is, uh, a lot of us very sincerely hope that we will get to see halflings arrive one day, uh, with some kind of like mercenary system where you're able to maybe field a unit of field wardens or a unit of yeah. like lump and crooks fighting cocks or a unit of badger riders. Um, do you ever have any, especially with like the old world coming up, are, are there any particular hopes you have as far as like playable halflings arriving on battlefields? If you had to pick like a couple of them to show up? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's Great. also, Oh, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, 
Uh, look, the Lump and Crook would be the, the classic because um, they've got even like the thing that fires the cooked chicken. Um, I think I think um, the uh, whatever it's called the the, the, the computer games um, uh, are a great place. They already have a, a good pl- presence for comedy mm. um, and and fun. So, um, but I, yeah, they're they're. And and to play around with cavalry as well. Like I don't know if they actually have cavalry that aren't horses in the game or aren't effectively horses. Um, oh, we got all sorts of weird stuff these days. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of bizarre <clears throat> things out there. <laughs> yeah, so there's all sorts of things that people can ride on, and and um, yeah, be be a lot of fun to just explore some of those things and do things with different models. Um, but there isn't actually that many um, uh, like NPCs in in the. Um, in the uh, in the setting that are established halflings, right? Um, uh, and that was something that we sort of we I, I would, when I did all that research for for fourth ed, I was like going, there's very actually few except for um, his me the the elector and and um, and lump and crook. There's there's very few named characters, mm. um, and that would always be be interesting. I think to, um, I mean, there's a few in the novels as well. Um, uh, but it would be great to see that get developed yeah. and like someone write a campaign, you know, and just go, let's mm. actually, Oh, I would, I would, I would love it. Have you ever, yeah. have you ever thought about whether unofficially or officially ever doing kind of like a, like a one shot moot adventure for people like a, like some kind of like schism going on in the moot that just introduces a lot of characters and kind of the politics yeah. going on between the different clans. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, there was a lot that we put into, um, into the the archives where there's there's the beginning of, of people thinking about splintering. Yeah, um, there's a ton in here about the clans. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've got like it's really one of the things that's actually really interesting politically about about Warhammer the, the old world is that they are beginning to move from the empire sort of state of feudal medieval Europe into mm. towards nations and city states. So you've got um, you know, Tilia isn't really a country; it's a series of, of independent cities. You've got the wasteland splitting off and going where our own country. And at the in the fourth edition, you've got um, uh, I can't remember its name. The the city that the campaign is set in. Um, oh, Ubersreich. Uh, yeah, Ubersreich is Ubersreich. Like yeah, Ubers a, is, a big old is, mess. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like yeah, we think we might not need the empire anymore. Um, and halflings have this history of of being that kind of nation as well. They were sort of created as a joke, and then they went, no, we think this is actually our homeland. And so when they see Ubersreich and Wasteland doing that, they're like, yeah, we could, we, we can talk about this. And um, there's just a, so much interesting things you could explore there, especially, as you said earlier, because they're right next to, to um, Til- Til- Sylvania. So they have, in that sense, a bargaining chip of going, you can't just crush us because if you do there's a an army of vampires to the to the east that will come through Mm. um and i think there would be a great campaign there set somewhere like um um sour apple or or down in funzig which is almost again half and half and just be like you know top level high level nobles and electors going what does this mean geopolitically um uh, you know and the avalanders and the and the um sterlanders not wanting to lose territory, and then it b- bubbles up into this whole potential war. And mm. again, greenskins, vampires taking um uh, taking advantage of that kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, yes, yeah, there's a there's, and we worked really hard to sort of put that stuff in there, right? Um, as much as we could, and yeah, it'd be great to develop it camp. Um, I think I think in general it's hard to sell people on campaigns. Um that's why most of them have been digital so far you know mm. um right yeah. but um yeah and and there's lots of ways you could take it as well you go you could explore um you know a new technology coming out from the halflings or things like that um yeah i think and, i recall yeah. uh an adventure hook in second edition that i i remember it grabbed at me because it was so it was it was funny but also intriguing in a way there was kind of like a children of the corn reference or it was like there was this halfling clan that was sacrificing people to a mysterious entity so their crops would be really great. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Which was such a which was such a crazy idea, but I loved it. Of like, they're this because a lot of people, you know, there are a lot of like very very minor gods and almost spirits in the Warhammer world that can do stuff like that. Um, yeah. And it, I always love the idea of there being this terrifying group of halflings who are all who are all sweet, and nice, and stuff until you slept in their inn and then you just vanished one day. Um, which was yep. always such a fascinating uh, proposal for a campaign or, a, or at least a little adventure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we, we sort of um, talk about that very briefly again in um, in in the archives that there that there definitely is in the Greenleafs um, the best yes, tobacco. Yeah, Greenleafs. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, because they have this um, swamp god or bog god or ancient farm evil thing that they're that they're offering sacrifices to, and that's also yeah, it comes back to what we estimate halflings and it, it and how they're pastoral. The flip side of like, oh, we're we're a lovely pastoral, um, friendly farm people is children of the corn and and chainsaw massacre and all this sort of American rural horror. Mm. Um, and the halflings are just perfect for that. To just go, yeah, 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 look, everything has its own rules down here. We go at a slow pace, which also means there's nobody coming to save you. Um, and we will just chop you up into little pieces and get away with it because who's going to complain? You know, you're a human and we're halflings. We all stick together. Yeah. Um, well, and it's that's, like, who, who's um, going to believe you got killed by halflings? Like what? Yeah, could, exactly. It comes just, back to just, that. Just, like, just, just push them over. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's just perfect for that kind of rural horror. Um, and, and yeah, um, the, the, and it, it, yeah, going back to Stephen King, the children of the corn and also, um, pet cemetery plays around mm. with that idea that what if something innocent becomes extremely frightening and children particularly, and, and the, the halflings are very childlike, um, uh, have that extra terror of um, this thing that I think is cute has suddenly become um, uh, has suddenly become dangerous and um, uh, yeah it's just great for horror great for for suspense yeah. Um, um, yeah so one thing I wanted to ask about uh, because I, I recall that uh, someone asked me this once and I actually found conflicting information on it so I was curious if you could clarify. His me Stoutheart, I think the the Elector Count, um, or like pseudo Elector Count, is his me male or female? Because there seems to have been kind of like an oopsie at some point in Fourth Edition where it there are different sources that claim different things about if it's yeah. a man or woman. Um, as far as I am aware, his me is a woman. His awesome. me is female. Um. But it is that there's also conflicting sources in the histories. Um, if you go back, that I think in the very early mentions, um, she is referred to as male, and they went, No, no, actually, it's more interesting if she isn't. Um, yeah, well, I, so yeah, Warhammer with conflicting stuff, say it ain't so. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know exactly when it changed, but but I, I found I've ran into that. It's like, hang on. Um, yeah, so in second ed, when I when I wrote about halflings, I, I made her sure she was female, and she's female here as well. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so and then I I think kind of uh, so uh, someone in chat wanted to ask a question. I think it's a great way to kind of start going into yeah, talking about yeah. the undead a bit. Um, how do the halflings kind of handle and feel about being on this border? with Sylvania. I know it's explored a bit in the archives, but just kind of for people um, listening in on the conversation, kind of want to hear it from uh, yeah. your own mouth. How, how do they kind of sleep at night knowing that they have one of the most dangerous threats in the old world, like kind of right there? I mean, a, part of it comes into the fact that halflings are very, very rarely tempted to become vampires. Uh, vampires are very snobby, so they don't want to embrace halflings. And we actually established in the vampire book that halfling blood tastes awful. Um, and is really thick, and so no, they don't want to drink from from halflings. So vampires just ignore halflings. They're also, uh, I mean, it, we we talk about how um, humans are sort of a bit more full of dark magic because they're a bit more chaotic, and that's mm. also why vampires prefer to drink from them. So vampires look at halflings and go, they're the actually the opposite of what we want to eat and the opposite of what we want to be. So. They, they again, they ignore them because they don't think they're important. They don't want to eat them, and they also underestimate them. Um, and so 
you've got these halflings who are like, I'm not going to be seduced. I'm not going to be um, corrupted. Uh, and um, I'm going to be underestimated. And I'm very practical. Again, the halflings are very practical. They're just like, they're like, well, you know, it's a vampire. We've got to kill it, right? With mm. that sort of just prosaic thing. Um, and um, that gives them a bit of an edge. Uh, and yeah, the, there's... There is, but there and there is that thing of um, also sensibility in that practicality. It's like, well, you don't go out at night, you know. You don't go into Sylvania, you know. You you if you see somebody wearing a big fancy cloak, going hello, he's probably a vampire, so you just kill him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that kind of practicality, whereas the humans be like, oh, he's so fancy, um, uh, keeps them going, you know. And uh, but it's also something that's interesting to explore again. Um, it's something that they can use as leverage against uh, politically because they sort of exist. Even if, if the vampires march out, they either have to go through the moot, which is difficult, or they have to go around it, um, which slows them down a bit. So there's this political situation of, of existing as a barrier that they can, they can leverage. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we put a lot into, um, into night's dark masters of like, what makes a good vampire hunter? Um, Mm. And, and they're often, they're not, like, witch hunters tend to have more money, more resources, they have the backing of the state. Vampire hunters aren't cool, and so, and they have to be a bit more stealthy because vampires can bring resources against them. If you go into a town and say, I'm here to kill the vampire, then the peasants might be like, well, he's our lord and master, so we're going to turn on you. Right. So again, it's perfect for these sort of sneakier races to just be like, moving around the edges and taking out vampires like that. Right. Uh, yeah. Witch hunters tend to tend to have a pretty bad habit of being very overt and they get themselves uh, thrown off a building or something by a vampire. Like they, yeah. they end up getting killed in very messy ways. Whereas like, I, I actually think if I recall correctly, there being a halfling and, or like art um, in Night's Dark Masters from one of the careers of showing like this very unassuming, creature that could sneak up on a vampire while it's sleeping because like who would yeah. suspect a sneaky halfling and stake to the heart yeah. problem solved um which yeah. is i'm sure is an embarrassing way for the vampire to go out but <laughs> you know hey fair's fair um yeah so uh that actually kind of leads me into a fun question of uh one of kind of the more famous moments um in the in conrad von karstein's little notes about his histories being the crazy son of a gun that he was just like just wildly fucking crazy vampire who just was mm-hmm. totally you yeah. know batshit insane um there's a note in one of the older i think it's the sixth or seventh edition vampire count army book that he he turns a halfling kind of and it's like almost in quotes as a joke um yeah. and it, it never gets mentioned again this this poor this poor vampire halfling and i've kind of always uh it almost seemed like it was vaguely implied that it either died very suddenly or or like very quickly afterwards, or that one of the other vampires may have killed it because they were like, ugh, um, just put the poor thing out of its misery. Uh, do you have any thoughts about if that that vampire halfling might still be wandering around, or if it even still exists? Was it ever what was it ever real, or was it just a, a rumor that never actually happened? So this is again comes back to sort of the weirdness of research. When we did when we did Night's Dark Masters, uh, working with my very good friend Jody, and we sort of split the book up into two, and I did. Um, Vlad and and Magnus and he did Conrad. So I know don't know very much about about the Conrad law, um, but look, I, I what what I like to do is never shut a door. Mm. So what we would probably say is you know, it's generally believed that the other vampires killed this thing, but it could make a great story. You know, the one vampire halfling that's still out there, still living on his wits. You know. Um, that could be a really interesting story, and he might have more allegiance to his halfling relatives um, than than being undead or something. Or he might be an interesting uh, thing that you know can could have a split war, a split split allegiances, mm. you know, and, and change his mind about who he supports and things like that. Because he would be a, such an outcast in vampire society. Um, so, um, uh, I think it's just a really interesting thing to sort of go and again. We 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 when we wrote. Um, Night's Dark Masters, we, we, there's some texts that say you can't turn halflings, it's just impossible. I think we love, we don't want to ever completely close the door. So we said, it's, there's no, you know, there's, it, that's generally what's believed. There is no evidence of this. 
Um, but we never said it was biologically, you know, magically impossible. Mm. Um, uh, and that way we went, it's up to you, your campaign. You know, if you want to make it all about that, we haven't made it impossible. Um, we've just said it's unlikely uh, and, and rare. Um, and that's, that I think gives you, yeah, more options. Awesome. And so I kind of want to use that as a branching point. One of the... Uh, one of the many, but one of kind of like the major controversies that was like a huge talking point uh, during the end times was that an elf vampire kind of popped up, but it was, it was a bit weird because like one author said it was a vampire. One author said, no, it's not a vampire. It's this other thing. Um, but I, one thing that I uh, often get asked about uh, by people reading through the lore and like I've read through so many books trying to really find kind of a definitive answer of like, why, you know, so I've always kind of leaned of the opinion that they don't exist because perhaps they can't exist due to the way they were initially created being that humans, you know, become the first vampires because they, you know, Neferata, she creates this, this flawed elixir to be get Nagash's immortality turns her into a vampire. Oops. You know, she shares it with the other court and then they, they, you know, start spreading like a, like a virus almost or a parasite. And, um, but it was like very human contained and we've kind of never seen it branch out of humans where, you know, there's no, there's no vampire dwarfs. There's no vampire elves. There's no vampire halflings. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do see it a little bit with like, okay, there was that one perhaps time with the vampire halfling. There's, you know, the, or there's a, you know, there's a famous story about an ogre who, while he's not a vampire, he eats a necromancer that was in the middle of casting a spell and he becomes kind of this necromantic creature um bra the slave lord so but it but i've always kind of hold this thought of well ogres and halflings and humans seem very close you know they kind of the old ones kind of created them all at the same almost the same time and they seem very related in a lot of ways whereas the dwarves and the elves are so wildly different of the dwarves being so anti-magical and the elves being almost so magical that they're like a different thing entirely um do you have any thoughts on kind of the whole debate of like, can there be elf vampires? Can there be dwarf vampires, but they just haven't appeared for another reason or eh. it, 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 it's very it's interesting. Really, that we talk about a lot. Yeah. Um, and, oh, we, we, we really dug into this when we were writing night stock masters and we didn't want to again, say anything was important. Um, we did talk about, you know, why the possible reasons. Um, again, we wanted to leave the door open so your campaign could be like that. We right. talked about why vampires tend to be obsessed about humans and whether it is just possibly just a human curse. We even talked about the fact that it might manifest differently in different races. Um, generally, yeah, we say we, one of the reasons, yeah, we talked about humans taste better. Vampires are all predominantly human and they're, they're basically racists. So they don't want other other races around, especially since they're trying to be better than everyone. So they would never embrace the elves because the elves are already snobs. Yeah, you know, then they might have someone who's even. Yeah, if you're yeah. the coolest human, a in the, vampire in the room, elf would be all... intolerable yeah. to be around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and similarly, I don't think an elf would ever would would tolerate that sort of idea. They wouldn't they wouldn't willingly be embraced in any way um, because they would see that as as coming down. Um, <clears throat> because yeah. Um, so there's lots of reasons why it is very human focused. Um, and, and, and it also just fits a story better. Um, mm. uh, but it, it's, it's one of the things that's interesting is that in, in role playing games, like in fiction, you don't ever have to necessarily address this, but in role playing games, people want to answer. They want to know what is actually the biology at work here. Right. Um, or the magic. <laughs> or, you know, yeah. What is the, yeah. what are the rules of the universe? And, um, yeah, that was it. We, we sort of went into that a little bit, like how um, when vampires, what vampires are is they actually use, a, so they're subconsciously using dark magic, um, which they take from human blood mm. to exist outside of time. And that's why they don't age. That's why they're kind of, they're resistant to chaos because they sort of, they no longer uh, are, are ravaged by time and tide and things like that. They're right. sort of, and that, that right. reason they're undead. <clears throat> and so... The question then is like, uh, what are the other sort of sources of that magic? And we talk a little bit about how there are some vampires um, exploring. Like, can you, instead of feeding on blood, can you get like um, solid dar somehow or a container of dar? Yeah, and feed yeah, on like that? the, the, the Necrox being very obsessed with that. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> or even using warp stones somehow or something. And I think it'd be really interesting to explore some of those ideas where it's not so much like, it's not the same story. You know, it's not like the, the vampire seduces a dwarf or something, but there's a chaos dwarf that, that is full of this sort of dark magic and they make a deal with some vampire and there's this, so there's this, mm. this weird vampire chaos dwarf race that could be really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so I think, yeah, I think the idea is, is yeah, think about the sort of rather, rather than go, this is definitely how this, this, this works. It's like the logic is they are borrowing dark magic to stay forever outside of time how would you do that when you can't just get it from blood in the same way? So for, for you know, we talked about how Nekarks are using sort of different kinds of magic. They're exploring these kind of things. Um, in the Warhammer um, campaign, the, uh, the enemy within, there's even the Frankenstein that runs on Warpstone, which is really interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so obviously if you're doing this with dwarves, it might be something that's technologically based or rune-based, like... Um, runes don't work the same way as magic, but um, they're related. Mm. So, you know, there might be some kind of, you know, the Chaos Dwarfs might have found some Chaos runes that are really infused with, with, with Dar and, and Black Magic, Dark Magic, and, you know, they might have a way of where, instead of biting you, the vampires can actually carve runes into your flesh. And oh, then you, be, wow. you know, so, oh. you know, it could be something like that. So the... the um, the vampire dwarves are all based on like this sort of freakish tattooing or flesh mutilation. Mm. You know, that could be really interesting. So, um, yeah, I think the idea is, is sort of, is, yeah, obviously it, it, everyone wants a definitive answer and, and you can always change it for your campaign. But I, I, yeah, so my answer, is, it's all possible. Um, try and think of interesting things. Don't just go back to biting. Um, I think that's probably, if we ever did address it, we'd go, Let's do it really differently for mm. dwarves, and well, let's think about how, you know, the elves would probably have a cult around it and be very secretive, and it'd be very hidden, and it would be sort of like, yeah, we're experimenting with this weird human magic that that is like a little bit slumming it or something, and they'd have this very secretive thing, a bit like sort of cane cultists a bit. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think, well, I think I, it'd be fun to explore. I, I love that idea of like, it's not because I, I think when a lot of people think Warhammer Vampire, they get super obsessed with the idea of like, you know, fangs, blood, all that very stereotypical yeah. stuff of that. It no, it expands a lot more beyond that. Like it's parasitic in nature always, but how yeah. that parasit, uh, uh, that parasite nature expresses itself could very much ring, change dramatically of like, mm. I actually mm. really like that idea of like, if you had a dwarf that somehow became some form of vampire you know, they would probably rely on a very different method because we see with the chaos doors that when doors take magic into themselves, it doesn't really go well a lot of the times. So they would have yeah, to come exactly. up with a very yeah. different method. Um, that's actually a really interesting idea. Um, but uh, speaking of vampires and people like really always pushing for answers, um, one of the things that I, uh, so for anyone that hasn't read Night Dark Masters, you're missing out because it's a masterpiece of a book. It's amazing. Um, there are so many cool things in there. I will, I will never forget being, um, I had never thought of the idea of a vampire child being terrifying until in that book it explores, I think it's the neck, the given Necrock vampire character. Who's like a little mm. girl that stitches monsters together to create yep. like horrifying creatures because she has the imagination of a child and the magic to back yep. it up. And it's like, Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> She's really scary. Um, but one of the things people are always asking about when it comes to vampires, and we're we're kind of starting to see this explored uh, with Total War going to Grand Cathay, are the the missing bloodlines, the the mysterious yep. two, where you have Matmases and um, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, I think Matmases is the one that went south, and then yep. uh, the the Jade Vampire or the Jade Blooded Vampires who went to Cathay in the east. Um, yep. Is, is there anything Her you kind of, yes, yes. Harak day. Um, do you yep. have any kind of personal head cannons or, or thoughts on these? Uh, like we, uh, cause we're, we're seeing the Jade blooded vampire starting to crop up more and more and more thanks to total war going to crank and they, and it, it seems very likely we're probably going to see them getting some spotlight soon. Um, but, uh, if you have any thoughts on them, I, we'd love to hear them. Yes. Yeah, so back when we finished writing, um, 
uh, well, after writing after writing Knights Black Dark Masters, having written huge amounts of rules and background about each of the bloodlines, I was like, I will. I'm in that mode. I will have a shot at it. And um, I wrote sort of a, an unofficial thing and put it on my website. Like, here's his one version of what I might might do with them. Now, we didn't know as much about Cathay then as we know now. Mm. Uh, but actually, a couple of um, a, about a month ago, I stumbled on a YouTube channel that is mostly about the, 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 the computer games. Um, and they had found my, my because uh, it's still online, the thing, the PDF that I wrote. So I don't know if you can post this in the channel. Or something, I, I put absolutely this in the, can. Um, that link will go to something I wrote back in probably 2008 or something, um, the second ed, about my take on the jade-blooded and, and um, what I, uh, the, the desert... Oh, um, this is slick. Um, and look, the thing about Warhammer is, no, uh, like a lot of nerd lore things, is nobody ever throws anything away. So um, just recently when they did the, um, the magic book for 4th edition, they actually used some of the spells I wrote on my website back for 2nd edition. They went, we love your book. We'll just put a credit to you. Can we use your spells? And I'm like, yeah, go for it, you know. So even though they were never official for second, they now are for fourth. And so I'm I'm I would not be surprised if somewhere in 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 Total War or somewhere they they end up borrowing a lot of the ideas that I have here. Yeah, I um, will, uh, and I will uh, include links to all your. We'll we'll have like all your stuff um, down in the description because yeah. people are going to want to just <laughs> dive into that. Um, yeah, that so, uh, is I, awesome. I, I, um, just briefly the. The way I, my view of the sort of the, to do the vampires in Cathay, I, I was basing it um, sort of on, on myths of hopping vampires, um, and uh, they're basically there's very very few of them. They're very corrupt and sick, and they, they take lots of drugs, and so their blood is actually this thin uh, light green substance. So they're called the jade blooded, uh-huh. um, and they they are this sort of they're like the eunuchs in in ancient um, Chinese fiction, mm. right? This race of of long fingernailed, creepy old people who um, uh, just sort of mess with you from the shadows, but not quite in the same way as the um, as the uh, clan that I can't remember the name of. Um, yeah, so and they're um, they're often blind and they're often full of disease, and it's a very sort of different kind of aesthetic uh, that ties into that idea of the mandarin and the um, the Unix. And then, that is um, super cool. Like, that's a yeah, very, think, very fascinating idea. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's the Jiang Shi Chinese myth might, is, isn't really in there, um, but that's I was just riffing on on the, a different kind of source, and you might put some Jiang Shi in there. Mm. Uh, and, and for the the um, the Mark Masi, as I call them, I basically was riffing on off um, things like the Mummy. So they are um, these sort of um, their bodies are often eaten away by insects and carrion and and burned away by the desert. So they're this sort of shambling corpse kind of thing wrapped in bandages to hold them together. Um, and yeah, that that's uh, gives them that kind of look. Um, and they they are these sort of rampaging uh, tribes of vampires. That, that exist out in the deadly desert. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's, that's all there. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the total war channel found it. And, and, um, so I went onto their forums and the discord and uh, their questions. Um, and they were like, sure. We, they, they certainly believe that, that there were hints in the, um, cafe trailers and stuff that we might see more of this sort of stuff. So, I'm sure it would be. Yeah, great. I would. Yeah, I would say there's definitely uh, quite a few little little things that. And uh, granted, the to say that the Total War community is voracious is an understatement. <laughs> they, yes. they they like to they like to pick apart anything they can get their hands on. Uh, yeah. For things that may or may not actually be there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So um, kind of kind of looking at uh, uh, vampires and as the world is kind of um, expanding and growing, like we've got, you know, we're kind of in this weird place where like Warhammer sort of died and then it now it's coming back and like even bigger than it was before. Um, yeah. are, are there any kind of like um, whether whether looking at halflings or vampires or anything else, is there anything that you're kind of really hoping to see get focused on that member maybe never got the spotlight back in the old days? Uh, well, it finally has, but I'm really glad, glad there's a lot of free of work. Um, we were talking to Green Ronin about that back when 2nd Edition was sort of running down um, and going, we would really love to work on something about Lustria um, and possibly about pirates and things like that. And, mm. and um, So it doesn't surprise me that there was both a book about Lustria and a book about um, the high seas for 4th Edition, because... Um, it you know, if someone has an idea, then other people about it as well. So that was something we were going to do for second ed. Um, really go look if you want to do a pirate campaign, sure and explore it. You know, this is such a rich setting, um, and and a really really interesting place to explore. It really brings out more about the old world to be able to go to the new world and, and see all this stuff. Um, you know, and there's Sartosa and things like that. That um, so that's really good that it's happened. Uh, also because we, j I just couldn't get it out of my system after, uh, second it finished, I wrote a huge, with some, some lovely, lovely people, we wrote a huge fan supplement for Astalia. Oh, um, what? I need to see yeah, this. Is this also on your website? <laughs> yep. Awesome. Um, I'll just put, there's basically all the stuff I wrote, uh, on this link, which I'll post. Yeah. Now. Stop, man. Astalia is like a big requests for so many people because it's like it's right there <laughs> and it's so unexplored yes. we basically went we love second edition a bunch of us bunch of fans like six people or something wrote tilia and a, like four of us decided to do astalia and because i was the i was someone who'd worked on the on on, on the professional game i took lead on that and said okay this is exactly how we're going to do it this is the system we're going to use and it's a really big beautiful book um and yeah, again, I'd love to see what we did there become more official because, um, you know, that's how you, how you get, go down in the records at the moment it's sitting on my website. Um, but I think we did some really interesting things there. We, we tried to sort of do different twists. It's still, it's still the old world, but it doesn't have as much chaos, um, because it's Southern and it's mm. got different perspectives on the gods. It's a bit more like it's a bit more monotheistic in appearance where um, everyone worships uh, Mamidia right. and the other mm -hmm. gods are sort of part of her family. Um, and um, and well, yeah, that, it's... It, yeah, I, I, I love that so much because Astalia has always been so weird in that it's so unexplored from an, like for official publications of like, we've got some Talaya stuff because like the Dogs of War really went yeah. into Talaya. But Astalia has like always been so mysterious, and like there's been little snippets, like you know, the whole I forget what it's called off the top of my head. I think it was the Wars of Death, where there was like that really one big bad necromancer that came in, yep. and he gets killed mysteriously in the Temple of Mermidia. Um, yeah. But it's like other than that, like there's so little, uh, which is such a shame because like Astalia's, you know, Spain has a really rich uh, history that mm. could really be um, interpreted in a lot of really cool ways. Um. So that that's super awesome. I will definitely be delving into this. Uh, <laughs> I know what I'm doing tonight, but um, um, yeah, I, I really hope we get to see them uh, get examined so much more because it, it, it's. I don't mean this in a sh to throw shade at Talia, but it kind of feels like in some ways Talia stole um, Estalia's spotlight a lot of the time of like things that you, one might associate with a Warhammer um, Spain, like like the Conquistador type stuff ended up being given over to Talia instead. Um, yeah. uh, I think just cause they already had established stuff to work on, but, um, no, that's super awesome. So, uh, one thing I would, uh, have you ever, uh, with kind of, uh, you mentioned you worked on the Lustria book. Um, are you able to yeah. say kind of what parts of it you were, you were responsible for working on? Yeah. So, uh, I actually said, look, um, I didn't have time to do a lot of the history because again, there's so much written about Lustria and it was mm -hmm. a lot to dig through. So I said, look, give me something that we don't know actually that much about. Um, and so I ended up doing the book, the, the work on Skeggy. 
Um, oh, which, that's fantastic. Although, yeah. The sticky um, stuff is incredible, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Like the, the, oh, yeah. I love the King of Skeggy so much. She is fan. <laughs> she is a great character. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that was a lot of fun to just, yeah. Um, and that was also a chance to bring back again, talking about sort of saving things mm. in the realm of chaos book for second ed, um, or is that what it's called? I forget what it's called. The chaos book. Um, uh, Tome of corruption. Tome of corruption. That's what it's mm. called. Yep. Um, there's a great chapter about, about the Norse. And it hadn't really turned up in third ed or, or, or fourth ed yet. And so I was like, oh, this is a chance also to do a bit of that, you know, to put that into fourth ed law so it gets lost. And um, so there's a lot about the, the Norse. There's, there's getting to flesh out what Skeggy, which we've talked, you know, it's been mentioned so many times, mm. the shape of it. Um, and we were talking earlier about culture clashing. Um, you know, it's, it's not really Norse, but it's sort of, it's trying to be Norse. Um, well, and, and uh, you, you did such a great job kind of establishing this like mystery for players to explore of like, why is this still here? Like the Lizardmen have flattened all these other places. These guys are flat out chaos mm. worshipers. How are they still here? And it's such a compelling mystery. Um, like, uh, uh, like I'm doing a, we're, we're doing a Lustra campaign that we're streaming every Thursday. Like we just started oh, awesome. and I'm so excited exactly. for when we actually get to the continent and have the chance to interact with Skeggy. Um, cause we're doing, we're doing the kind of thing of where we're going to the Isthmus of, uh, Pahox to set up a new colony. Um, but that yep. colony is going to need training partners and Skeggy's right there, but, <laughs> but it's Skeggy. Um, so really looking forward to that. Um, and it's, it's such an imaginative thing of how you developed the, um, developed the settlement. It's, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing stuff. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with that. City guides I also just love because I think cities are very interesting at trying to figure out um, uh, you know, how cities have their own character and, and, and um, uh, systems and mm. how they work. Yeah, so um, and I think Skate, you could just run a whole campaign there. It's just a really fascinating thing about I mean, that again, we're saying, why is Lustre interesting? Because it's this interesting contrast. It sort of throws everything into sharp relief. So, and Skeggy is a perfect example of that. It's like trying to be an old world sort of supplement, uh, civilization in a place where a lot of that doesn't work. Mm. And um, yeah, that's just really interesting. Like, how do they try to go, well, let's just keep doing everything we do back at home um, and, it, and, and pretend it works. And that's just that's interesting sort of yeah to play and to um uh and to explore yeah i one thing i'm really hoping for uh, especially since i mean you've gotten to work on skeggy and like all these pirates and the illustrious stuff and the vampires um one of my biggest hopes i don't think they're gonna do it anytime soon because it kind of felt like illustrious was a bit at the end of the current trilogy they were working on and i think we're setting off to new horizon soon but um mm -hmm. They've been kind of touching on the Vampire Coast a lot, where we got you know yeah. some mention of Vampire Coast stuff in the Sea of Claws, and then they released uh, the the online only supplement for the Shade Wraith, um, one of the big bads from the Dreadfleet expansion, um, where you can oh, like right. encounter you can encounter him and he's all terrifying and stuff, and you can have a fun thing there. And then of course with Luther Harkin and all his shenanigans in Lustria, um, yeah. Uh, do you think uh, you'd ever have any interest in or? or um, of maybe exploring the, the maelstrom kind of where the, the main storyline for the Dreadfleet takes place where it's like the other side of the great mob, but it's like a big, un the galleons graveyard where all things that die at sea go to be devoured by this mysterious thing. And, uh, you have, um, uh, count Noctilus there is the big bad. Um, I, I yeah, dearly absolutely. hope, I dearly hope one day we get to explore the galleons graveyard. Cause it would be such a fun, like terrifying dungeon type yeah. place yeah absolutely um i mean that's one of the fun things about working on warhammer um is that you can throw in all these little things um and and then years later or even decades later someone will go I should actually explore that and so very often as as you've mentioned with the sort of throwing all these ideas in by the way this and this and this um and it's there for for you to explore in your your campaign, whatever you're doing, but it's also like just do a whole book on that. Um, 
And yeah, look, the, there's so much in the Warhammer world that we're still exploring. Like, getting stuff on Cathay is something that we sort of never thought would happen um, hmm. back in the day. You know, we 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 knew it was there, but it was like, ah, we we don't need to. Um, and it's just sort of existed a bit like Lustre is like a place that was was mysterious and far away, but didn't have an army, so there was no reason to really go into it. Um, and now. Um, Total War's gone, yeah, no, we're going to do that. It's like, okay, great. You know, so then there's, um, we can learn more about Ind and the Southlands. Um, mm. You know, I'd love to see new takes on them and just go, you know, to be still learning about new places in Warhammer. That's amazing. And I'd love to work on them, yeah. Um, mm, yeah. Just about what book's coming out and what what um, what the, what what, uh, what Cubicle 7 can afford to put out and, and what I have time to work on. Yeah, I, you know, looking at your Jade Vampire thing, like my mind's just a buzz with stuff because one of kind of one of the more pop or uh, it obviously it's been talked about a lot. Uh, when they revealed Grand Cathay, they revealed that there are some non playable vampire factions there. There's a Vampire Coast faction, and then there is a there's a traditional Vampire Count faction as well, um, right. which has yeah. led to a lot of speculation about if we got playable Jade Vampires, would they be Vampire Coast or would they be Vampire Counts? Um, mm. And there's been a lot, one of, I think, uh, the a very popular theory I've really enjoyed was the uh, the from our world's real history the really really famous pirate queen of China, um, of yep. her inspiring like a jade vampiress who's inherited from Harakte's line. But reading your thing, like, like now I'm like, oh, if you can bind like that, could be such a great. Those would be terrifying pirate lords of like yeah, also wielding yeah. like all of this pestilence and like. Uh, other scary things while also dominating the coast against, fighting against yin yin. Um, but, uh, as far as just kind of, um, so we've talked a little bit about Astalia. Are there, as far as the completely unexplored places when looking at either like the, the blood Naga of Koresh or the kingdoms of end, or maybe like the human tribes of the Southlands or Nippon. Um, do you have like, uh, do you have like a, person you'd put or a place you'd put number one as far as your your if you if you got to decide where exploration happens next um do you have a, a favorite um hmm, yeah it's it's interesting um i wouldn't mind knowing more about the northern uh like i mean we uh northern continent above hmm. lustre of, of, about nagaroff oh yeah um um and and what else is sort of didn't in there, there besides dark elves? Didn't there used to be centaurs um, there like a long time ago? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, like another, they haven't <coughs> been talked about in like twenty years, but <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I mean that that uh, again. I, I think I've lost it now. But one of the things I was toying tooling around with is another setting for the game is like move it forward a thousand years and the settlement actually begins to take over Nagaroth and it's more like um, colonial America, which mm. could be really interesting. But um, yeah, look, it's, there's, there's, um, I think it would be really interesting to see how people would tackle some of the things like Ind in the Southland without um, finding, sort of, you know, doing things that are, are not um, Eurocentric. And doing finding a way to do them well because so often they're sort of represented as the the views of what the European people had of them at the time, and right. um, it would be a really interesting challenge, I think, for someone to go, well, how do I bring that sort of um, uh, sense of of satire, but but not in a um, parochial looking down sort of sense, um, right? And and um, it'd be a kind of sort of what they call Afro fantasy sort of thing. What if you know, with 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 people from Africa writing their own their own mythology, um, and I think that could be a, like a really interesting flip on a campaign of, of mm. um, how does the Southlands, you know, exist as a as a sort of parody and reflection of of whatever period of like maybe the the um, the Mali times of Africa, you know, where they had mm. the Mali kingdom. Um, uh, or something like that. That could be really fascinating and um, a really uh, like something that I could never write because I just do not have the, the, the knowledge or the basis of anything like that. Right. Um, uh, and same thing with India as well. I think again, amazing 
alien culture. Um, we've done, there is a little bit out there about Nipple Cafe, which is also, you know, so it's, it's sort of established to be very Earth history like, and that's mm. fine. But I think um, it'd be really good to just go, let's actually go back, start from scratch. We know a little bit about in, again, we know nothing about them, which is really. There's sometimes I think there was talking about there being ape men in them, which is pretty racist. Yeah, but well, it's it could, I think I think the tiger men are probably the most established thing, and th th and they've yes. been referenced quite frequently in Total War. Um, right. In recent yeah, so times, tiger men, that could be really interesting. You know, um, have a a whole new sort of furry kind of race. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. So one of those two, I would just love someone to go. You know. Even it could even be like a whole new game line, like inside, like you know, assuming nothing, like you come in and you're playing in one of those settings, and, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening in, um, with these kind of non European fantasy worlds. And it would be amazing to just sort of tap into that and go, right, what would happen if Warhammer came out, but it was coming from entirely the perspective of someone who was building an Indian fantasy or something, you know, with some of those with the Hindu gods would be amazing. I think to play around. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of, one of probably the most popular, um, which uh, I know like it's, it's usually considered better for people who are actually having to write stuff. That's going to be considered canon, not to delve too much into fan works. Um, but uh, probably one of the most popular fan works, especially on Reddit, is there's a group of writers and artists from various um, Southeast Asian nations who have been working on how they would imagine the Naga of Koresh. And they've come up right. with like these amazing like monsters and designs of things I've never heard of in my life. And like and they're they're brilliant. Um and there's such a like a fresh take on a lot of things that I don't think people from more Western cultures would ever really think of because we're not you know, yeah, we didn't grow up with a lot of that, um, and there's a lot of strength to be had in at least having someone on board who who knows these things, um, mm. which yeah. I I think that also played a lot into how Grand Cathay worked so well with Total War and that they had just made Total War Three Kingdoms, so they already had a lot of people yeah. they had been yeah. working with who knew a lot of Chinese myth and mythology ready to go, <laughs> which probably helped yeah. I imagine. Um, well, yeah, uh, that sounds great. I'd love to uh, you, you post that link to if you can to. I, I absolutely to, will. I, uh, the I yeah. yeah, I uh, I know one of the authors, but they do um, they they've been do making incredible stuff. Um, but uh, um, one other thing I kind of wanted to ask you, kind of in relating to this, I, I talked a little bit to Andy Hall about it, and I'd just be curious to get your take on it. Um, what kind of are the like looking at Warhammer, which has this very unique thing of it is like a bunch of different, um, like it, you know, it's kind of like our world put into a grinder, add in some fantasy spice, some satire, some, um, a lot of skulls hit mix and then pour it out. Um, what are kind of like the challenges when trying to approach that, especially when dealing with, like Lustria, for instance, which draws very heavily from like um, Aztec and Mayan themes and Nahuatl culture. Um, like what, what's, what kind of goes through y'all's um, minds when like, okay, I've got to write this, but I'm dealing with like some really different things here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is really important. I think to understand, uh, to be careful, I guess, to be, to be, to not be lazy. A lot of Warhammer was originally just thrown together very quickly. Um, because, I mean, originally Games Workshop just existed to sell miniatures, and then they went, oh, we better build rules, and then we went, we better build a world. And some of some of the things that went into the European stuff is really thoughtful and clever and satirical. And then they went, oh, there's probably, you know, a, a, a China, a, a South America, and, and they're a bit, they were a bit briefly drawn, and they therefore they can draw on these racist cliches of of the the other but then they've done things where they've got um oh, fantastic um they've got um you know the 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 lizard men are actually the 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 good guys of the setting they they're the ones who are closely related to the ones they're the ones who know what chaos is um and that's just a nice sort of twist already um and i think um you you if you do your research into real world cultures and and with a sense of when we're not here to make fun of them and we're not here to just be lazy, um, 
you can um, you can you can have you can get some really interesting things. But I also think uh, Warhammer has a lot of satire in it, mm. and that's a tricky area. Um, I like to compare them a bit to Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, you know, with the Mikado. So the Mikado, uh, the the operetta is 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 sort of set in fake Japan, and it does make fun of Japan a lot. But it's also supposed to be a satire of how much how the British think Japan works. So mm. there's a little bit of pantomime in that. So in one ways, it's very diminutive and, and uh, parochial towards Japan, but it's also it's got satirical elements in it. Um, so it's not supposed to be. You're not supposed to necessarily think, oh, this is just people laughing at Japan. Um, and that's a hard line because right. when you write parody, you are inherently undercutting things. Um, and so that's really easy to do about Europe because, you know, they're, they're, they have a very dominant culture and I, I'm in that culture so I can make fun of that. Um, when it comes to making fun of other cultures um, uh, and... and, and it's it's important to, to sort of be careful, I guess I say. Mm. Um, so, for example, when we was when I was working on the North, um, I was pretty. I was trying to be clear that this wasn't anything about Vikings. Like, even though they come from that sort of area and they have some elements in common, I was like, this is what their culture believes. You know, this is why they have that. This is and and. Um, not trying to sort of go like use a lot of obvious tropes so it didn't use i didn't like try to reference things like eric the viking or new jaws saga or anything like that there's a little bit of that already in there but i deliberately didn't go let's do a lot of norse norse research let's instead look at what we've got and go well, what what is this actually about and um i think the norse society is really interesting because it's a lot of it is based on um on, on storytelling and bra braggadocio and being someone who can um, not just do good in battle, but come home and keep telling your legend. Mm. So for me, I was like, okay, well, what what kind of societies do we have now where mythologizing people um, is, is part of why the culture is so toxic? And I was looking to things like Silicon Valley, actually. So... For me, the, the Norse in, in, in Lustra are a little bit like a parody of Silicon Valley. Um, so there's this society where because people are famous, they must be geniuses and they should be worshipped and do everything they say, even though they might have terrible ideas. Mm -hmm. And they, there's no way to sort of get away from that. Um, and so I, th I think by thinking... So that was something that I did. It was like, I don't want it to be a parody of, of the Norwegians, um, because I don't know enough about that. And um, to get those jokes to really land, you have to really know the culture. Um, so I deliberately, consciously stepped away from it myself and said, I don't know enough to do that. And then I also tried to put some hints in the text of, these are not Vikings. They don't think like Vikings. These are the things they believe. And then what do I know that I can talk about that issue? Hmm. Um, and I think that's really, a lot of what I, when I'm writing, Try to think of what's going on in, in my life, in the world, or the people will likely know and explore, because um, that helps ground it. So for the Skaven, for example, when we worked on the Skaven, um, and there's, there's this thing where they don't exist, the perfect example there were people who are anti-vaxxers and, and people who <laughs> uh, believe in flat earth conspiracies, right? So right. what we went with is like how easy it is for people to just go, oh, that's all that's all nonsense. And so a lot of the Skaven book, the first bits, the, the first front of the chapter is about what's it like to live in a culture where there is no absolute truth and it's very, and how easy it is for people to just go, no, that doesn't exist and, mm. and talk about that issue. So that's for me is what I always try to do is like figure out what I'm actually talking about and really try to ground it in something that people can understand um, and, and go, oh, that's just like what I see outside my window. Mm. Um, so I hope that, does that give you some, some, no, that's, yeah, answer? that's, that's a fantastic answer. I literally see people chat going, that makes so much sense. Like that is like such a great, uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I absolutely love that. Um, as much as I would love to just keep picking your brain about things, I think we're pretty much out of time. If I have been keeping my clock correct here. Um, yeah, a couple more minutes. 
So uh, I do want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, if you wouldn't mind kind of taking just a little bit to tell people what you're working on these days. Like, what, what are you up to now? Yeah, where, so... Where can they um, find you? Yep. Um, uh, back about in 2017, I finally started my own company, which is called Tin Star Games. Tin like the metal. And uh, we've been self-publishing games. I've still been freelancing. Um, on, I keep my hand in in... Um, in Warhammer and some other freelancing. I also worked on the Chew RPG last year, uh, which is based on the comic. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but it's a really fun comic. Oh, okay. yeah. And I had a lot of fun basically doing all the lore for that setting. So reading all the comics, just like I do with Warhammer, reading, 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 and putting it into text. Mm. Um, uh, but yeah, we've been publishing um, a lot of small games, micro games, one-page RPGs, and we've also published a whole bunch of bigger RPGs. We've basically done one over the last, one every two years over the last six years and uh we've got a game about uh, modern day angels and demons um and um uh which is called relics and uh it's a fairly traditional rpg we also have a game called partners which is about uh solving mysteries um if you've ever watched you know any of those many many tv shows about about two cops who go off and try to solve a mystery every episode that's what partners is about oh cool and, okay um just a couple of weeks ago, we, we, we kickstarted a game called The Score, which is uh, a very unusual kind of RPG. It's designed to run in 20 minutes or less. It uses just 18 wow. cards from a deck, and it simulates the heist genre. So that was me looking around going, the reason most people can't get into role-playing games is they're like, you have to read huge chunks of phone books. You have mm -hmm. to... Spend an hour making a character. You have to spend four hours playing a single game. You might be playing for six months. I'm like, what if we just got rid of all that and go, here's a role play game you can play in 15 minutes. Um, and it's really exciting and it's really different. Um, and I'm hoping that the well, Kickstarter went really well. And I'm hoping it'll keep selling and give people a different idea of how to role play. Uh, uh, well, I, I am actually going to probably pick that out because I know a friend who would love that. Um, who does a lot of stuff like that. So that's actually a really cool idea. I like that a lot. Fantastic. Yeah, that, so yeah. late pledges are available. Um, uh, on the, on the, if you go to the Kickstarter, which I'll also post here, you can click on late pledge now and grab copies. We are finalizing the prototype at this point. Um, and uh, we should have it out to backers by September or October. Okay, great. Um, um, and I, for anyone watching, I will have all the links of everything we talked about down in the description in the pinned comment, so you'll be able to find everything uh, we talked about super easily. Um, that is fantastic. Uh, great. Um, any, anything anything else, or is that... Uh, can people find uh, you on, like, Twitter anyone... or Discord or whatever? Yeah, um, uh, I'm on, we have our own Discord, and I'll put a link to that as well, Tinstar Games. Um, and I'm on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, um... Uh, if you have any questions about Warhammer and stuff, I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, so you can just find me there. I'm Tin Star Games almost everywhere. TikTok uh, on Twitter, I'm Tin Star Games with a uh, a one at the end um, uh, because the other account got sh shut down. Um, so uh, I'll throw you a, a link to the um, to the Discord as well for you. Great. And yeah, Tin Star Games everywhere, and I'm always happy to to chat um if you've got some weird question about oh how does this i've got a guy who always is obsessed with asking me skaven questions every now and then he'll just be like <laughs> what about this um so uh um yeah um but i'm happy to talk you know awesome um, guys make sure he doesn't regret opening that door for people <laughs> <laughs> be polite <laughs> Um, yeah, just don't call me in the middle of the night to go, I need to know what my character is doing. <laughs> um, but but yeah, just if you if you PM me or or, or tag me on disc on, on Twitter or whatever, um, love to have a chat. Awesome. So I got one final question for you. Uh, a very difficult yep. hot topic question. Of all the seven, who do you think is, in your opinion, the best vampiric bloodline? Oh, it's a tough choice. Um I because I wrote a lot about them, um, so I, when we split the books up, I did the Blood Dragons, I did the Neck, I did the Strigoi, and I did and the Castines, and um, I really dug into the Castine lore and particularly Manfred. 
and it's really hard. Like I wrote a ton of stuff from Manfred's point of view, mm. um, and and got inside his head. And as a result, I just I'm very much Team Manfred, um, and so I'm always drawn back to the von Cast, even though it's a bit cliche. Um, but uh, they all the vampires are, are. But yeah, so I'll vote. I'll vote von Karstein. Awesome. Okay, I lied. I got one last little question for you, just because you yep. mentioned that. Um, so I love Manfred. I think Manfred's a great character. Uh, like a lot of people don't know. Like we have like an entire book from him, being the Liber Necris, which is awesome. It's like a really really fun yep. right. Um, but uh, a lot of people don't like Manfred. Uh, he got a lot of bad flack after kind of the unfortunate job he got uh, stuck with in the end times. Um, yeah. Are you able to give kind of a summarized why Manfred is awesome? Like a very short little uh, summary about why he's a great character, and why people should uh, check, like learn more about him? <laughs> I think, I, well, what I like about Manfred is he's someone who is, uh, he, he's in very aware that every other vampire invasion of the old world has failed and he's trying to work out why and he's trying to figure out how to sort of solve some of the problems that 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 evil overlords face um but he's also he's he's actually got this sort of what i like about him at least the way i write him is he has this kind of classic um doubt as part of his character that's like uh, he, 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 he thinks he should rule the world, but he's always afraid he's going to fail. And so what he part, he's almost like working against himself as he sort of goes, I should be the, the, the coolest person in the world. I should rule everyone, but I have to make sure that nothing ever goes. And so he's imperious, he's ambitious, but he's got this sort of nagging sort of self doubt that keeps fucking himself up. And that kind of really interesting. I, I think. I think the von Karsteins in general, and the vampires are raw, the when they wrote the, the von Karstein trilogy, each of the vampire, the, the sort of von Karsteins have this flaw. So, um, uh, Vlad is, is, is um, just too vain, and he thinks nothing can go wrong. Conrad is too crazy. He's just too bloodthirsty, and he thinks that 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 violence solves everything. And Manfred's problem is he's too careful. He's too cautious. He's too intellectual. And I mm. think that's just a really fascinating thing to explore. Um, it might not make him the coolest guy in the world. That idea of someone sort of trying to understand how to rule the universe is almost like a puzzle, um, mm. but also kind of ending up fucking himself over, if I excuse my language, but because he's... Oh, no. You're all good. He has, sure, <laughs> he has to make sure everything's perfect. And and I think mm. I see a bit of myself in that, where he's like, he's this perfectionist and um, and and is afraid of making mistakes. Um, and that's just, I find that just really interesting as a character to, to explore. Well, I, I think that's such a perfect way to look at him of explaining like how he's been around for so long but he always takes these really yeah. careful like he you know he, he could be launching constant invasions but he doesn't you know he goes to yeah. Nehekara and he goes to Nagash's art he's like trying to figure out like where Nagash fucked up and where his yeah. dad fucked up and where Conrad fucked up and all this stuff which is just it's so interesting um yeah and that, you don't really you're very it's a very unusual trope in fiction to have someone going around going where did person X go wrong? And I need to understand that. And that's just, I think, I think a really, it's a very uh, unique kind of villain. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I've already kept you over time, so we're going to get you out of here. Right. Uh, it was an absolute delight. I uh, hope we can have you on again sometime. Uh, but uh, this was a blast. Um, I'll make sure everyone can find all the links and socials and everything down below. Uh, but thank you okay. so much for coming on Lorebeard and uh Chat, uh, we'll see y'all next time. Thanks for watching. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.